very warm welcome you watching news 18 global i'm akanksha swaroop khalistan terrorism is now at the center of india and canada's standoff and on monday ottawa expelled a top indian diplomat this amid a probe into the killing of pro khalistan terrorist hardeep singh nijjar on canadian soil shockingly enough the canadian prime minister justin trudeau has claimed credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the indian government and the killing of nijjar soon after new delhi expelled a senior canadian diplomat olivia silvestre he has been ordered to leave india within 5 days while many are calling it a tit for tat move new delhi's decision reflects its growing concern this at the interference of canadian diplomats in india's internal matter and their involvement in anti india activities it should also be noted that hardeep singh nijjar was gunned down on 18th of june this year outside a sikh cultural center in surrey so who is hardeep singh nijjar he hailed from a village in punjab jalandhar he moved to canada in the year 1996 and got involved with terrorism with babbar khalsa international he established his own group band terrorist group named Khalistan Tiger Force he was also associated with band indian separatist group seeks for justice and at sfj nijjar was number 2 after gurpat vant singh pannu so much so an interpol red corner notice was also issued against nijjar in the year 2016 in the meantime let's now play out what canada's prime minister and the foreign minister had to say Over the past number of weeks, Canadian security agencies have been actively pursuing credible allegations of a potential link between agents of the government of India and the killing of a Canadian citizen, Hardeep Singh Nijjar. Last week at the G20, I brought them personally and directly to Prime Minister Modi in no uncertain terms. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation of our sovereignty. It is contrary to the fundamental rules by which free, open and democratic societies conduct themselves. In the strongest possible terms, I continue to urge the government of India to cooperate with Canada to get to the bottom of this matter. I also expect it to re reiterate that its position on extrajudicial operations in another country is clearly and unequivocally in line with international law. We've been clear we will not tolerate any form of foreign interference. Since this was brought to our attention, we've been guided by three principles. The first one, we will seek the truth. The second one, we will protect Canadians at all times. And thirdly, we will protect Canada's sovereignty. I have conveyed these principles to my Indian counterpart, and I've also told him that we expect India's full collaboration to make sure that we get to the bottom of this. And as of today and as a consequence, we've expelled a top indian diplomat from canada canada said on monday it had credible information linking indian government agents to the murder of a sikh separatist leader in british columbia in june an accusation india dismissed as absurd and motivated canada also said it had expelled a senior indian intelligence official but gave no details The separatist leader Hardeep Singh Nijjar was shot dead outside a Sikh temple in Surrey, British Columbia on June 18th. Nijjar supported a Sikh homeland in the form of an independent Khalistani state and was labeled a terrorist by India in 2020, according to Indian media. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Monday did not directly accuse India of being involved. However, he did say his country's security agencies had been pursuing allegations of links between Nijar's death and India's government. Any involvement of a foreign government in the killing of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil is an unacceptable violation 
of our sovereignty. It is contrary to the fundamental rules by which free, open and democratic societies conduct themselves. As you would expect, we have been working closely and coordinating with our allies on this very serious matter. Muninda Singh, director of the Canadian Sikh Coalition, said Monday his community wanted to see what Ottawa would do next. We have a mixed kind of emotion right now. Uh, that's kind of uh, one is we are acknowledging that Canada has acknowledged India as an actor and done it from Parliament. Uh, and on the other side, we're wondering what the next steps are going to be as well. So I think there's mixed feelings at the moment. Canada has the highest population of Sikhs outside their home state of Punjab in India. It's also been the site of many demonstrations that have irked India. Monday's announcement will likely further strain bilateral ties, with New Delhi already unhappy that Canadian authorities did not crack down on Sikh protesters. The two countries were earlier trying to hammer out a trade deal by the end of this year, but have now frozen talks. Canada gave few details, while India cited, quote, certain political developments. What will be the impact of these deteriorating diplomatic relations between Canada and India? Let's try and delve deeper into this. And for that, let me introduce my guests today. I'm joined in by Michael Kugelman, who's the director at the South Asia Institute at Wilson Center. I'm also joined in by Dean Baxendale, who's a renowned columnist from Canada. Many thanks to you gentlemen for joining in. Michael, if I could begin with you, India's external affairs ministry has said that allegations of the government of India's involvement in any act of violence in Canada are quote-unquote absurd and motivated. Trudeau says his allegations are based on intelligence gathered by the Canadian government. In such a scenario, before the investigation arrives upon a conclusion, is Trudeau's reaction rash and impulsive? Well, certainly uh, the fact that, uh, that uh, Prime Minister Trudeau himself came out with these allegations and did it so publicly is indeed very striking. One would have expected perhaps that um, uh, it would have been done uh, more discreetly, which is typically how these things work in diplomacy, though honestly I would um, I would argue perhaps that um, this is a reflection of how strained the relationship is between Canada and India. The fact that the Prime Minister simply was not uh, willing to give attention to the notion of of being discreet and not really caring about the the possible ramifications for, for relations with India by making this uh, bombshell allegation so publicly uh, and standing in front of the House of Commons as well. And I would also say that um, for the prime minister to come out and make these allegations publicly, that suggests that uh, he feels quite strongly about how accurate they are uh, for the, the fact that he would go out there and be so open about it. All right, uh, Dean, if I could bring you in on this. Many are calling it a knee-jerk reaction because that's exactly what I was asking Michael because the investigation is still not completed even though Canada claims that there's intelligence input coming in. But how do you weigh in on this reaction? Well, I, I think at this particular uh, point in time, you know, what has happened is that supposedly, uh, according to you know, contacts that I've reached out to, and reading also the Globe and Mail was about to break the story that the credible intelligence comes from the RCMP investigation in Vancouver or Surrey, British Columbia, where this incident took place uh, and uh, Najir was murdered um, and also through CSIS. Uh, this supposedly was one of the topics that uh, Justin Trudeau had been raising or trying to raise with Modi while he was there in India for the G20. Uh, have we jumped or has the prime minister jumped conclusions? Uh, I guess that is going to play out over the next uh, 30 days or so when we see more evidence uh, as to the allegations. But for a prime minister to rise in the House of Commons to suggest that a foreign government has been involved with uh, a murder, ostensibly an assassination, of a person on Canadian soil, and whether or not Najir was a citizen or not is still a question mark. Um, but obviously, that's egregious behavior by uh, a foreign government, if true. Uh, Michael, Najir is one 
or was one of the most wanted terrorists with an Interpol notice that was issued against him in 2016. What does it speak of the Canadian government's support to Khalistan extremism? So I think this is a reflection of just why there's such a conundrum here for, for India and, and, and for Canada, for that matter, that uh, indeed for India, um, you know, this is someone who, who was a terrorist, who is a dangerous figure, who is a, a bona fide security threat to India. But, you know, Canada looks at these these issues very differently in the sense that um, it, it emphasizes, uh, you know, notions of rule of law and freedom of speech and, and so on. And it's not willing to act as robustly as India would prefer it act to to address these Indian security concerns. And I think that's a big reason why we're where we are today with the state of this uh, relationship, because for India, it's it's a no brainer in the sense that this is someone that needs to be apprehended, that someone needs to be dealt with others like him as well. But for Canada, there's just a very different position taken. And one can understand when there's such differing views of how to go about this that the two capitals would be at the loggerheads that they are right. now. Right. D Dean, you heard what Michael had to say. What explains these differing views? Because remember, when you talk about Canada's support to Khalistan extremism, it goes beyond Niger. Let's not forget what we uh, saw happen in Brampton, that uh, uh, float, in fact, almost celebrated the assassination of India's former Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. Yes, you know, in Terry Molesky's book, the former CPC correspondent, um, you know, which I've been reading uh, and, uh, you know, bought that book actually while I was in Delhi in April, uh, you know, spoke to, you know, the Khalistani separatist movement being homegrown within Canada and not within the province of, of Punjab, per se. Uh, as far as the red notice goes, I, I think we have to be, you know, um, we'll, we'll take it that this is a valid red notice, but I do know of a number of dissidents who have spoken out specifically against the Chinese Communist Party uh, and uh, human rights activists for the Uyghur, head of the World Uyghur Congress, Dolkan Issa, who was also banned from coming to India, uh, had a, a Interpol red notice against him, accusing him of being a terrorist, a murderer, uh, separatist, and that was on his record for 21 years. Um, now, I, I, I would, in this particular case, and I don't know the details of the red notice that uh, that India had provided the information uh, for this, uh, the reality is, is that the Canadian government uh, has chosen uh, not to um, prosecute or, you know, even it appears uh, to look further into uh, Mr. Najir's uh, direct uh, organization and, and uh, with uh, Sikh separatism uh, or having, you know, a separatist state uh, in Punjab uh, for, for Sikhs. Uh, so I think we have to be careful about the, the red notice, but uh, the reality is, is that, you know, Canadians have had their own um, you know, experienced directly with terrorism going back to the uh, late 60s with the Federation de Liberation de Quebec um, and the, called the FLQ uh, when they kidnapped Pierre Laporte, a British diplomat, and he was assassinated. We brought out the war, basically the War Measures Act, you know, martial law to stop, uh, you know, this from playing out. Uh, and we then had a close to 30 year struggle with various referendums on, you know, Quebec separating from Canada. In the end, they chose to stay within Canada. Michael, the question still remains. The kind of support we've seen Canada give a Khalistan movement is not what we've really seen coming from UK or Australia, even US. The British government has allocated new funds to tackle pro-Khalistan extremism. Australia has made assurances to curb uh, the movement, also reflects the global community's commitment to bringing justice. Why is Canada so apathetic and tone deaf to India's concerns? No, it, it's, it's certainly important to note that there has been a um, differing responses from these different countries um, that have these 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 activists on their uh, on their territory, and I think indeed the perception is that Canada has been much more reticent than any of the other countries to address Indian concerns 
not even uh, you know, offering public statements, public condemnations when there have been demonstrations that turn violent directed at, um, at Indian diplomatic facilities. And we have seen that happen in some of these other countries where the governments have been uh, have condemned these things. Uh, I don't have an answer uh, to be to, to quite frankly, though I think again, that you know, Canada is is a country that um, really emphasizes this notion of um, you know freedom of speech, freedom of uh, you know freedom to gather and and demonstrate and so on. That I think that um, you know the Canadian government simply has chosen to be very cautious about how it handles this uh, this issue. Now there's some that uh, suggest that there's um, domestic political factors at play here in Canada that the Canadian government is trying to be cautious about not wanting to alienate uh, uh, the Sikh diaspora community. I can't speak to whether that's true or not, though I think that that has to be seen in in the context of this question about why has Canada's why has the Canadian government's response been so much less robust and so much less emphatic than India would like to see, especially compared to how 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 governments in the UK and Australia and the US have responded to this issue. Let me bring in Dean on that. Dean, how do you weigh in on what even Michael's saying? Because uh, the reticent approach adopted by the Canadian government uh, is, is in fact getting blatant day by day. Yeah, that remains a mystery. Um, and But I think it lies in part in the fact that uh, you know, we have a diaspora Indian community here in Canada of uh, over 1.4 million uh, within our Canadian population. Of that, 770,000 um, have identified themselves as, um, you know, uh, practicing Sikhism or uh, here in Canada. And the governments, quite frankly, um, and this is what is being done within the China diaspora community and the Iranian diaspora community in many respects, is that foreign governments, uh, you know, have uh, ultimately influence operations inside Canada and other democratic nations uh, to, uh, you know, stand for uh, and allow, uh, in some cases, um, these extremists or individuals that, that are um, known to be criminals to operate with impunity uh, and foreign governments and, and you, know, you know, whoever is behind the Sikh you know, the Kalistani separatist movement, and there are many, you know, certainly uh, are gaining or have had political influence in this country to diffuse and to um, obfuscate uh, those operations here in Canada. Michael, what we are now witnessing between India and Canada marks a new low in diplomatic relations between both the nations. What explains this deteriorating relationship? I think that uh, the reason why things are so bad now in terms of relations is that, um, you know, we have seen what appears to be stepped up uh, activism and protest by uh, these these Sikh uh, activists, including those that support the idea of Khalistan in a separate state. We've seen this activity increasing in Canada and also in the UK and Australia. And I think that has sharpened Indian concerns about this issue and likely has caused India to increase its pressure on Canada to deal with this with this issue that India regards as a major concern. And Canada has doubled down and, and not addressed this issue in the way that India would like. So I think it's it's that combination of, um, you know, just more happening on the ground, so to speak, growing Indian concerns and pressure on Canada and Canada is really taking the same position that it's taken for quite some time. Uh, and I think that's a big reason why we why we are here today. And I also it, it also appears that when Prime Minister Trudeau visited uh, New Delhi, it wasn't a very good visit. They had a very uh, Prime Minister Trudeau had a very tense meeting with Prime Minister Modi. And then, of course, the whole weird controversy with with Trudeau's airplane, I think, sort of let sort of led into these uh, these existing tensions and and mistrust and so on. And, uh, you know, that could be a, a, a contributing factor as well to Trudeau's decision to go public with these allegations. Right. Dean, one can't help but wonder why is Canada digging its heels into the ground so firmly? That too for an issue which the world is acknowledging uh, as, as, as a modern face of terrorism as far as Khalistan movement is concerned. I, I think really this, you know, comes down to you know, we can we can trace it in part back to uh, the ill-fated uh, Justin Trudeau 
uh, you know, visit to India uh, three years ago, uh, in part. And in fact, I think the recognition by the Indian government that uh, they didn't feel they had a partner in the Canadian government, which seems to be what is being expressed within the Indian media and certainly in Modi's uh, comments. Uh, and, uh, and unfortunately, it's at a time where we need to have consensus between like-minded democracies to fight terrorism, to fight uh, transnational repression, uh, and to fight election interference uh, by foreign and malign states within our own politics. Uh, so it's a da dangerous time. And when we need to be creating trade opportunities, uh, right now, two-way trade is about 8 billion US between uh, India and China. It's about an equal um, you know, two-way trade uh, relationship. And there was opportunities to expand that dramatically. But we all must, to your point, be aligned on the issues around um, extremism and that is being perpetrated within our own countries. All right, my last question, which I'd like to take from you both gentlemen. Michael, will the tense diplomatic relations between India and Canada finally impact the deep-rooted people-to-people -people connections, not to forget uh, the thriving trade and economic ties that remain so prolific so far? This, I think, is what's very concerning. Um, and we know that there's a very large uh, um, trade relationship between India and Canada. Uh, India views Canada as a, one of its key Western trade partners. And what we've seen is that trade has gotten caught up in the broader tensions in the relationship. And I don't think it's a coincidence that um, Canada very recently uh, announced it was halting talks with India on a new trade deal. I think it's tied to this to this broader issue. And that's that's very concerning for the relationship because many relationships, even when they're strained, continue, can continue to have uh, cordial uh, commercial relations. I mean, you look at the India relationship with China, for example, there's still a lot of trade going on there. So the fact that um, trade appears to have been become caught up in this broader uh, tension point in the relationship, it's an ominous sign for a relationship that I believe each capital would very much like to uh, continue to flourish. But you know, given how bad things are and given that uh, you know these tensions are seeping into other, uh, what would one expect to be safer areas like trade, it's not a good sign for the relationship. All right, Dean, let me have your closing in thoughts on this entire matter. Do you think that the fallout is going to be one that will have lasting impact? You know, I think that remains to be seen. I think, first of all, we have to let this this investigation take place. I think we ha have to have, a, you know, go its natural course. You know, if the RCMP and CSIS are making specific allegations um, uh, with respect to the murder uh, of an individual on Canadian soil, then we have to let that play out. Um, and, you know, we don't know that it wasn't, you know, own, you know, within the Sikh community that could have been involved with this, rival gangs, et cetera, that could have perpetrated this crime. Um, so we must let that play out. Um, and if it's found to indeed be true that India was somehow involved, then I think that will create, um, you know, significantly higher tensions and something that we need to work out very quickly uh, at a negotiating table, understanding the positions of, um, of both uh, governments uh, and try to move forward in a, a positive, proactive way that, you know, adheres to the rule of law, understands where red notices, uh, you know, are issued for individuals, that uh, we must seriously look into those uh, allegations, and we must act as a nation to protect our sovereignty and security, and not to okay. allow um, this to, uh, the, these kinds of um, manifestations of, uh, of a Sikh separatist movement take place on our soil. I think all the China, uh, sorry, all the Indian diaspora community in Canada wants peace, wants to have good relations uh, with India. We want to see that relationship grow and opportunities to grow for trade. Uh, and, and I think we have a bright future together, but, but obviously this is a significant hurt.
All right. Many thanks to you, Dean and Michael, for joining in on this discussion. We'll have to see how this entire controversy actually folds out in the next few days, as we all have already informed you that the investigation is still ongoing. On that note, it's a quick wrap from my end. Thank you so much for watching News 18 Global.